Hello and welcome to another video in this series as we journey from the very simple primes to the foothills of the Riemann hypothesis. Today marks um, a new phase in our journey. Um, previously we've explored the primes um, as a set of numbers. Um, we've looked at some of the properties, their distribution. And today we're going to make a bit of a leap into the complex domain which is where um, a lot of the interesting and challenging um, work uh, around prime numbers has been done. And in fact, that's where the, um, the famous Riemann hypothesis uh, lives. It lives in the complex domain. Um, so today we're going to gently take our first steps into this new world just by exploring um, what the landscape looks like a little bit. So to recap, um, one of the last things we did was arrive at the famous Euler's Golden Bridge, as we call it, the Euler product formula, which was quite important because it connects the integers, the normal numbers, to the primes. And that was always something that was fairly elusive, this an ability to encode the primes in some kind of formula. Um, and you can see it reproduced here. Um, and just to kind of remind ourselves, the sum of 1 over n to the s, where s is a parameter, the sum of that for over all integers is the same as this infinite product, which is 1 minus 1 over p to the s, all inverted, summed over all primes. So the product is over all primes. So this is all about primes. This is all about integers, and this is called the zeta function, the Riemann zeta function. And we know that this thing encodes information about the primes, and we've already seen that if we can manipulate it a little bit, out pops information like there are an infinite number of primes, or that the primes aren't so sparse, you know, that is the prime harmonic series, the sum over the inverse primes diverges. Now we've We've worked those things out before, but they were a little bit of extra work. Um, but this time they pop out of this magic um, Euler product formula, this golden bridge. So that's nice and interesting. And we think um, at this stage, you know, just us, that there's a lot more to be found as we explore this formula, this Euler product formula, this golden bridge, as it were. Um, and the direction that we're going to go in is to think about that parameter s in a different way. So previously we've considered s as an integer. So when s is 1, it's the harmonic series, um, you know, 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 and so on, which we know diverges. When s is 2, that's the Basel problem. 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 4 squared. And we know that was a historically famous problem that was difficult at the time. And Euler solved it um, in an interesting way. Uh, and, and it converges to pi squared over 6. And we've looked at this before. So if you want to go back and refresh yourselves, do go and have a look at those videos and the blogs that are associated with that. We then said, actually, what if s is not an integer, but is a real value that could be something like, I don't know, 9.73 or 1.5? Um, and we proved um, that this zeta function converges for s more than 1. That means it doesn't converge for s is 1, the harmonic series, but it does for 1.1. And that's a natural question to ask, you know, if s is 1 diverges and s is 2 converges, is there something in between um, where it converges and diverges? And we, we actually showed that it converges all the way up to, but not including S is 1. So we looked at S as a real value, not just an integer. So the next step is to think of it as a complex number. So this zeta function becomes a, per, a, a function over the complex domain. It becomes a complex function. And it was um, Riemann who first took it in that direction. Um, 
So the Zeta function has been around um, before Riemann. You know, we know that Euler, you know, developed this particular equation. Um, but because Riemann did a lot of very interesting work in the complex domain, including the famous Riemann hypothesis, it's become known as the Riemann zeta function. So if we think this zeta function over the complex domain, if we think that way of looking at it might reveal new insights into the primes, I guess the first thing we should do is to just understand what that um, zeta function looks like, how it behaves in different parts of the complex domain. And a good first question is, you know, where does it converge? Where does it diverge? Before we dive, and that's what we'll do today, we won't do anything particularly complex today. Um, I think there was a pun there. <laughs> um, but we will kind of um, uh, build a mental picture um, of where it converges and diverges. And we'll also look at this function um, in 3D form. Before we dive in, um, just to set some conventions around terminology. So S is complex and in almost, it's become tradition. So in almost every resource, text, course, lecture, you'll see it written as sigma plus IT, where sigma is the real part and T is the imaginary part. You know, these are arbitrary, it could be A plus I, you know, A plus IB, but this has become tradition. And sometimes you'll see these things referred as, you know, just sigma, and they assume you know that it's the real part of this S. So if we write the sum, 1 over n to the S, if we write that out explicitly, sigma plus it, we can split it into the product of these two factors, 1 over n to the sigma, which is the real part, and 1 over n to the it, which is the imaginary part. And we'll, we'll find that kind of useful. So let's start building up a picture. I'm just going to draw a picture of the um, domain here, of the complex domain. That's the real part. Let's call that sigma. And that's i t imaginary part and in all of this we are asking where does it converge where does it diverge what does this function look like um, so that's what we'll add to this picture as we go along so the first um, um, win easy win is if we look at the series but look at each term replaced by its magnitude so remember if it's a complex function with complex terms, it's easier to think about the size of those terms if we think about their magnitude. So let's see if that takes us anywhere. So the sum of those magnitudes, we can rewrite it like this, as we said, S is sigma plus it. And that a very, very common and useful, not a trick, just an aid, is to be able to write n to the it as e to the it log n. Let's explain where that comes from. It's Once you see it, it's really easy. But the first time, um, you, you, you might be unfamiliar. So we've got n to the it. And actually, we want to write it as e to the something. We want to write it as e to the something, because that's a nice, useful, easy, common base. We can do things like you know, differentiation and so on. If we take logs, we have i t dot log n equals x. And that is what that is. So that means n to the i t equals e to the i t log n. So that's um, a very easy uh, transformation. Uh, you'll be able to do it without thinking about it in future, but the first time you might not be familiar with it. So for example, 2 to the um, 5 is e 5 dot ln 2. I hope that's right. I'll have to check that afterwards. <laughs> I hope I haven't got that wrong. <laughs> but it's just a way of changing the base. Great. So if we do that, we see that e to the i 
something always has a magnitude of one. Why is that? You might remember that e to the i phi is a unit vector. It's, a, it's the complex number of magnitude one, minus one, minus one, where this angle is phi. There's, you, know, you can go back to the textbooks to justify why that is, but for, for most people that just becomes an identity, you know. And it means that this thing always has a magnitude of one, and the as you vary phi, all that happens is the angle changes, but the magnitude doesn't. So this just describes a point on a unit circle. So if this has a magnitude of one, that means this bit, e1 over n to the it, has a magnitude 1, so we can get rid of it when we're thinking about magnitudes. So this simplifies to the series of absolute values is a sum over 1 over n to the sigma. Now, the thing to recognise here is that this now only includes the real part of s. The imaginary part has gone away, it's not relevant. The interpretation is that the real part of S is what determines the magnitude of those terms. The imaginary part plays no part in the magnitude of those terms. That's a useful intuition. Um, and this is where we suddenly make progress because we already know, because we've done this in previous videos, that when sigma is real, it converges for real sigma more than one. You might remember that we did this by comparing it this discrete sum to integrals, continuous integrals. Um, some people call this the kind of um, integral comparison test. Um, <clears throat> go back and have a look at those. It's very it's an important method. Um, so if if this on the right hand side converges for sigma more than one, that means the left hand side converges for sigma more than one, and this is absolute convergence. Because when we say a series converges absolutely, we're saying that the series with each term replaced by its magnitude converges. Now it's an important principle, important fact, um, which is pretty much, you know, everyone knows by heart, um, is that if a series converges absolutely, then it also converges. And intuitively that makes sense, because the terms replaced by their magnitudes are always um, the same or bigger than the um, other terms. So that means if the series of absolute values converges, then so does the series, the normal series, with you know, the original series we were looking at. So we've proven that this zeta function converges for real part sigma more than one. Let's update our picture. So if this is 1, then everything to the right of it is a point where the zeta function, zeta of s, over here converges, so I've coloured it green. It doesn't include um, sigma equals 1, it's just sigma more than 1 converges. So that's our picture so far. We don't yet know anything about what happens to the left of that, but we know that for any s where sigma is more than one, that converges. And intuitively makes sense because those fractions get smaller because the bottom of the fraction gets bigger. Great. Let's look at another part of that um, complex domain. And the other easy win now is looking at what happens to the left of the origin for sigma less than or equal to zero. And the way we can understand that is looking at each term in the series individually. So individually it's 1 over n to the s. Its magnitude, as we've said, is 1 over n to the sigma, because this thing is at magnitude 1, just, just the imaginary part. Now remember we're back in the real domain now, sigma is real, not complex. And this is easy to think about. When sigma is less than one, it in effect inverts n. 
So one over that quantity gets larger. Let's let's write that down in case it's not clear. So if I say one over, let's say three or n, yeah, let's say three to the minus two, that is the same as three squared. If I say one over n to the minus five, that's the same as n to the five. If I say one over n to the zero, that's one over one equals one. So whenever that power is negative, the result is a number that's more than one. So when sigma is less than one, or in fact less than or equal to zero, that quantity one over n to the sigma is more than or equal to one. You can try that with a few fractions yourself. That might be really obvious, or it might not. So when sigma is less than one, the magnitude of the terms grows larger than one. So we end up with a sum over terms whose magnitude is larger than one. If sigma is zero, then we have the terms of size exactly one. And again, a series of terms of size one um, diverges. So in both cases, the sum diverges. So let's bring that back to the uh, kind of a mathematical principle. For any series to converge, it is necessary that the terms, the size of the terms, gets smaller towards zero. Here that's not happening for sigma less than or equal to zero. The terms aren't getting smaller, they're in fact getting bigger. So the series diverges and let's update our picture. Let's use a, a red colour to indicate that. So for sigma less than or equal to zero, it diverges and I've coloured that red. There you go. So converges over here, converges and then diverges over here. So we're left with this mysterious strip in the middle between a zero and one, not including zero, um, and maybe not including one. What happens here? So that's the next um, thing we're going to look at. What happens to this zeta function in this area? So we've almost built up a complete map. We just have a missing area. Now, to answer that question requires just a little bit more maths um, and it requires us to think about those series in more general terms. That series we had, the Riemann Zeta series, is called a Dirichlet series and there are lots of kinds of Dirichlet series and the Zeta function is just one of them. So we we need to refer to the theory about Dirichlet series, about when they converge and diverge, in order to complete this picture, to find out what happens in that gap. Let's explain Dirichlet series. So normal power series are things like um, A plus Bx plus Cx squared plus Dx cubed and so on. Those are the normal power series that we're used to. With Dirichlet series, the terms are of the form a to the n over n to the s sum. That's the general form, and that's a Dirichlet series. When a n is always one, that gives us the zeta function, one over one to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on. If a n wasn't 1, if it was something else, that would be a different Dirichlet series. So you can see the main difference is that here we've got positive powers 
and here we've got um, negative powers, but the the variable is um, is the power. Um, so they're, they're, they're similar looking but different. And the theory, which we'll look at in a different video about where these Dirichlet series converge and diverge, we'll look at that separately because that's a whole kind of piece in itself. The idea is that um, unlike power series which converge in disks in circular regions, the Dirichlet series converge in half planes. So there'll be um, a half plane and there'll be a line, um, the, it's called the abscissa of convergence, where to the right of it, it the series con di converges and to the left of it, it diverges and on the point um, it, we, 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 we can't, it doesn't say anything, we have to use different methods to work out what happens. So this is the kind of the edge of the region of um, convergence. And what we find is that for the zeta, actually we can do it here, what we know is that the zeta function converges to the right of some place, uh, some line, and if we find a point where it diverges, it's got to be on or to the left of that um, abscissa of convergence. We know this thing converges for sigma more than one. We also know it diverges at a single point, um, s equals one. Where so we know that the um, harmonic series S equals one, this point here, it diverges there. We know that, that's the harmonic series. So these two facts, that it converges for sigma more than one, and it diverges at one point, sigma equals one, that means that must be the limit. So it diverges at S equals one. That means the limit, the edge of that region of convergence is, is, is um, sigma equals one. That's how we work it out. If you want to kind of reread that or go through those steps again, Go, go through the blog because that kind of says it in more measured language. So that's summarizing really what we've just said. We know the zeta function converges for sigma more than one. Um, we know, there it is, that it diverges at s equals one plus zero i, uh, that is s equals one, that's the harmonic series. Therefore, it can't converge to the left of that. Therefore, sigma equals one must be the abscissa of convergence. Abscissa is just that funny phrase that you sometimes learn in books or they, you know, very old textbooks will call um, a um, line like x equals two or x equals three. They'll call that an abscissa. So that's how we know the zeta function diverges for sigma less than one. So let's update our map. So we can extend this divergence area right up to that line. Now, we look, it looks like we've completed this map now. We know where it converges and where it diverges, but it's not quite complete because, so let's summarize for sigma more than one, it converges sigma less than one, it diverges. We don't know what happens at sigma equals one. We know that at s equals one, at this point here, it diverges, but we, we can't say yet anything about what happens up and down that line. And today we won't get into that, but this gives us a complete enough map um, to, to kind of, you know, think about visualizing this um, zeta function. 
So we've concluded that the series converges to the right of sigma, sigma equals one. And we can then think about plotting it or visualizing it. And we can do that um, um, using kind of computers or just writing some code to, you know, um, calculate that sum for many, many, many terms. Now, because the input to the function is complex, the output is likely to be complex, and it is. And visualizing um, complex functions isn't trivial because we have a two-dimensional input and a potentially two-dimensional output. So an easy way to kind of quickly get a feel for a function is to, yes, plot the t use the two dimensions of the input as, as axes, so the real part and the imaginary part, but we can visualize the output um, by squishing it into just its magnitude. Um, so we visualize the magnitude. We lose some information there, but you know it gives us a feel for the size of the function. And this is um, what it looks like. You can see that um, at s equals one, where we know it diverges as the harmonic series, this thing, the values you can see are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's the singularity, that's the divergence. But away from that, the function seems to kind of behave itself in terms of not being too big. Um, in fact, it smooths to the right as, as sigma the real part gets larger, the, the kind of the oscillations seem to dampen right down towards an almost constant value. Um, let's look. Let's zoom in a little bit on that. So this is the same picture. Oh, just to say, what we're doing here is plotting not just the magnitude but the logarithm of the magnitude, and we do that just to scale down some of the very large values and accentuate some of the um, the kind of the features. It's just a common trick when you log plot um, uh, um, numbers which have a large kind of range. So let's zoom into that a little bit there. So you can see at s equals one plus zero i, the values kind of explode to um, um, uh, uh, a divergence. But away from that, as to the right, as sigma increases, we can see the magnitude of the function dampens right down and the oscillations kind of all, almost vanish. Can't say that they do vanish. Um, and for small sigma, we can see this thing oscillates up and down a little bit, which is interesting. So we'll come back to this. So that's our first um, peak, that's exciting. That's our very first peak at the complex version of the Riemann zeta function. You know, this mysterious, powerful function which encodes the primes. Um, that's our first peak at it, our first visualization of it, our first sighting of it in the complex domain. I, th I think that's quite a, quite a moment. <laughs> um, let's crack on. So, We've talked about the spike at s equals one, and that corresponds to the harmonic series. We've said that. Now we've also observed that for larger sigma, you know, as we move right along the complex um, plane, it seems to smooth out. Uh, let's confirm that mathematically, because obviously just observations aren't mathematical. And let's write out the series. That will help us. And we can see intuitively that as s gets bigger and bigger and bigger, these fractions get smaller and smaller towards zero. So as s goes to infinity, those terms go to zero, except the first one, because one to the power um, one to the power infinity is still one, whereas in all these cases, one over larger and larger um, numbers. Um, gets the, the result is smaller and smaller. So you can see intuitively how as s gets bigger and bigger to the right, all the terms get smaller and smaller towards vanishing, except the first one, which becomes one. 
that's a little bit wishy-washy, hand wash, hand waving. Intuitively, that makes sense. But if we want to be more precise, we say the magnitude of the terms n to the minus s, which we know is n to the minus sigma. As sigma gets larger, n to the minus sigma gets smaller towards zero. So we've, we've shown it, you know, um, more rigorously. And therefore all the terms um, go towards zero except the first one because um, one to the um, minus very, very large sigma tending to infinity still remains one. So that's a nice easy result. That just shows that to the right, the zeta function's magnitude tends to one. It doesn't say anything about its um, uh, phase, its kind of imaginary um, value, but just its magnitude. Now we're going to do something a little bit interesting. Um, we're going to leave uh, on a bit of a cliffhanger, <laughs> which we'll try and resolve next time. Um, so the question or the observation is that aside from that singularity at s equals 1, that function didn't seem to diverge anywhere else. Let's look at that picture again. So you can see here, apart from that single point where it diverges, anywhere else it didn't seem to diverge. Now remember we said this series converges for sigma more than one, and that's why we cut it off at that line sigma equals one. We didn't calculate it to the left because the series would have diverged. But looking at the actual magnitude, it doesn't seem to. It looks like it was prematurely cut off. It looks like we could have continued to the left. This does not look like um, a function which diverges everywhere to the left of sigma equals one. You know, we know intuitively that functions that behave well are smooth and continuous um, and don't have sudden abrupt cutoff points. You know, even the singularity, there's a lead up to it. Um, so what's going on? That's a mystery. Well, it's not a mystery. We know the answer, but <laughs> are we going to think about it and, um, and resolve it next time? Um, let's look at another view of this function. So this is the same plot, um, but what we've shown is the ISO lines of the magnitudes. So this is a little bit like a, a height map or, you know, a, a map of mountains where the lines are of equal height. Um, so all the points on these curves have same height. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see that, again, they seem to be artificially or prematurely cut off at this sigma equals, you know, sigma equals one. It looks like we should be able to continue up this slope. This does not look like it naturally ends there. These ISO lines are cut off. The the surface seems to just artificially end there. What does that mean? Does that mean that the function actually does continue? Um, but that's a contradiction, isn't it? Because we've just said that the series diverges to the left of sigma equals one. What's going on? So that's a question we will answer next time. Fantastic. Um, we'll leave it there. I hope we've whetted your appetite with a little kind of cliffhanger mystery. Um, I think it's really um, important today that we saw for the first time um, this mysterious, powerful function in the complex domain. Um, that's quite an important moment for us. Great. See you next time. Bye.